We're going to finish up our sermon series called Pray Like This, but we will not be going to Matthew. We're going to be going to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 4, and uh, give you a moment to turn there. And after this, we'll have a very short time of prayer, and then we'll have communion together. This is the last in the series of Pray Like This. And um, how many of you have been influenced by this sermon series? Raise your hand. I know I have for sure. It's been a blessing to me. It's grown my prayer life, and I hope it will continue to grow yours. We are creatures of habit, aren't we? (laughs) Raise your hand if you're sitting within two spots of where you sat last Wednesday night or the last Wednesday you were here. Go ahead and raise your hand. Pretty much everybody, for the most part. There's a few of you that are risk takers and you you did something different and that's awesome. But for the most part, ladies, what do you do that is habitual? Something just same thing every day. What is it? Anybody? Hair? I heard something about hair. (laughs) Well, I hope that's not just the ladies. Shower, yep, shower. Um, Guys, how many of you shave and you start on the same side? Anybody do that? Start on the same same side? face now maybe you start with one you always put the left pant leg in guys and girls right we're creatures of habit and uh and that's okay that's not a bad thing unless we become too habitual in our prayer routines um the lord's prayer specifically we want to not make it a habit we need to remember that it is an outline, as you're getting some notes there. We need to fight against habit in prayer. That's my point. <laughs> Took a while to get out, but it's out. We need to fight against habit in prayer. Even though this is an outline of prayer, even though the Lord in Matthew uh, is telling us a format to pray, we don't ever want to get caught up in praying the same way over and over and over again. And so as we finish out this series of Pray Like This, I want us to remember three things as we pray like this. Number one, to get right into it, we need to remember who we or you are approaching. Remember who you are approaching. In Hebrews 4, 16, if you're there, say amen. Amen. Hebrews 4, 16, it says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence or boldness to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now this first point comes from this line that says the throne of grace. When you hear the word throne, what do you think about? You think about a king. What else comes to mind? Power. Loyalty? Royalty. Okay, what else? Maybe authority? And with this... With the people of the Old Testament especially, they would see a throne and they would live in a monarchy and they would know that the throne represented these things. They would know that the throne represented the ultimate law, the ultimate truth. They would remember that the throne represented judgment. So there's a lot of things that we think of when you see this phrase, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne It's important to understand in prayer that you're approaching the throne of God. Amen? It is a high and lofty thing to behold. And when we approach the throne, we must remember we are coming before the king, the king of kings. And so we should have reverence and and in a heart sense be bowed before him. Our attitude and our demeanor should be one of reverence and respect. Warren Wearsby said, scripture warns us not to get too, I like this word, I feel like it's an English word, too chummy with God or to treat him as though he were one of us. What a great quote. Scripture warns us not to get too chummy with God or to treat him as though he were one of us. When we think about the throne of grace, we should have that reverence and respect. Psalm 50, 21 is not on the screen, but listen to what it says. It says, this is the Lord responding to the sins of the people and how they were treating him as God. He says, when you did these things, speaking of these evil things, and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you. But I now arraign you and set my accusations before you. 
David said in Psalm 55, 19, God, who is enthroned from of old, who, what, does not change, he will hear them, speaking of those who are evildoers, and humble them because they have no, what, fear of God. He's talking fear there, he's talking about reverence and respect. God who is enthroned, there's that word we're looking at tonight, throne, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them because they have no reverence or respect for God. Charles Spurgeon said this, this, this is in your notes, it's not on the screen, it's a great, great quote. He says, familiarity there may be, speaking of our conversation with God and our approach to him, but holy familiarity, boldness, but the boldness which springs from grace and is the work of the Spirit. The boldness, I love this, of the child who fears because he loves and loves because he fears. That is the type of attitude we have or are to have when we go to the throne of God. You think about the Apostle John and his revelation. In, the, in, in Revelation 1.17, as John is on the Isle of Patmos, you remember before this, John has laid in Jesus' lap, has experienced a close relationship with Christ himself, and yet on the Isle of Patmos, he says, I fell at his feet like a dead man. So there's intimacy and relationship, but even more so you see reverence and respect. But it doesn't stop there, and praise God. Look at verse 16 again. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne. There is no period. It says what? The throne of what? The throne of grace. He says, let us come boldly to the throne. It's not just a throne, a kingly throne that emanates fear or respect or reverence. Those things should be there, but it's the throne of grace. Grace. What does grace speak of? Give me some words this evening. When you hear the word grace, what do you think of? Kindness. Kindness. Amen. What else? Love. Amen. What else? Compassion. Compassion. Anything else? Forgiveness, absolutely. Generosity. Limitless grace, limitless forgiveness, all of those things. Yes, ma'am? Mercy, amen. So we have a throne, we have a royal throne, and the king who sits upon it, and he is to be respected and reverenced, and we are to come with bowed heads and bowed hearts, and at the same time, we come with hearts that know we will receive the grace of God. That's our God. That's the king that we serve. Peter says in 1 Peter, he calls him the God of all grace. Now I want you to hear this very clearly this evening. We do not come before a tyrant. Amen. I was just in a Facebook discussion with one of my friends and it helped me just remember who God is. Help me to remember that God, though he is a God of wrath and vengeance. He is holy and just, and he will execute those things. He will not execute those things on the believer. Why? Because he has already executed those things on the Son. Jesus Christ took the wrath of God for those who would trust in him. And so we can come boldly before the throne of grace. So tonight you know all the things you need to know in terms of the format of the pray like this, right? Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. He taught you and I how to pray. But tonight we're talking about our approach in prayer. More of the heart attitude. So that we don't get caught up in ritual, in habitual exercises, and doing the same thing over and over again. Same thing, same thing, same thing, and it becomes dead. No, God says, I want you to approach me. Approach the throne of grace. Come with reverence and respect, but also come knowing that I am limitless in my grace. We come before a gracious king. This is also an oxymoron. What's an oxymoron? It's not an ox, that's a moron. <laughs> what is an ox? It's, it's, it's a paradox. We have a hard time fathoming how the two can go together, but I love this verse in Psalm. It kind of says it very simply and clearly. Psalm 2, verse 11 the psalmist said, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Now, reverence and trembling are same, right? 
When you reverence something, when you have a healthy fear, a healthy respect of something, you come a little bit trembling like a king who could take your head in a moment, right? No matter what, because he's the king. But it also has a very important word there. It says, worship the Lord with reverence and what? And rejoice. That is, have joy. Be exuberant. Bring praise. Be happy. Why? Because we don't come to just any throne. We come to the throne of all grace. We come to the God of all grace. You say, how in the world can this be? Well, that brings us to point number two. As we remember how you are able to approach the throne. Remembering how will help us come with the right attitude in prayer. I want you to turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Just a few over. Hebrews chapter 9. But before we read verses 11, I have verses 11 through 12 on your notes, but we're going to read 11 through 28 because I want you to see the whole thing. Let me ask you this evening, how were the people of Israel able to approach God? What did they have to do to approach God, to get their sins forgiven, to have mercy and grace showed? They had to go to the priest. Everybody got an A on that, A+. plus. You had to go to the priest, right? And the priest on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, would go into the Holy of Holies and would sprinkle the blood for himself, a bull, and for the people, a goat. And he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And it was by that that their sins would be atoned. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the average Israelite didn't drop to their knees before they went to bed. (laughs) They didn't have that type of relationship with God. They were dependent on somebody else. And so when we go to God in prayer, even with a pray like this type sermon, even with the pray like this model, we need to remember how we are able to approach the throne of God. They went through a priest. That's found in Leviticus chapter 16 and Exodus chapter 30. I encourage you to go look at the ritual that they had to go through. And they themselves couldn't even do it. They had to have somebody else do it for them. Well, let's look for a moment at Hebrews chapter 9. Verse number 11, if you're there, say amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 11 says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Look at verse 15. For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is there, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. Verse 19, for when every commandment had, spo- had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the, new coven- of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law... One may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch 
as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await it. You say, Dave, why did you read all of that? Because that is how you can come to the throne of God. It is so important to understand in your head and your heart that every time you go to the Lord in prayer and you come before him in bowed knee and bowed heart in reverence and respect, you are able to come without any mediator, without any priest, without any other man. You can come to him directly because of the once and for all shed blood of Jesus Christ. I should have got an amen. <laughs> it's something we take for granted as Christians. They couldn't do this back then. And so this in and of itself will help us not get so ho-hum about our prayer lives. Bless Susie and bless bless Sally and bless so-and-so and and watch over so-and-so. Bless the food. The blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ, has been spilt so you can enter the Holy of Holies. That should change your heart attitude in prayer. Because we are in Christ, we can approach the Holy of Holies, the throne of grace. Not because of anything we have done, but solely because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That is why we come boldly, confidently. We don't have to depend on the priest like the Israelites did. We have the man Christ Jesus. Remember as you're praying, remember as you come before God... To come confidently and boldly based on the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. Now lastly, we remember why we even approach. Why you go before God in the first place. We, I think, have done a good job of dispelling the old going to God as a genie in a bottle. Right? Hopefully we're pushing that out. There's not that there's ever not a time to go to God for your needs. But that's not the reason that you should be going to God in prayer solely. In verse 16, it says, So that, this is why we go before the throne, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Are you clear about why you go to God in prayer? Do you know 100% why God wants to talk to you and you to talk to him? He says right here it's because so that we can find grace and mercy and to have that help in time of need. You see, God wants you and I to come to him so he can give us grace when we need it, to give us mercy when we need it. Why? Because of one word. Prayer can be defined in one ultimate word, and that is the word relationship. This will prevent against Habitual prayer, rote rehearsal prayer, saying the same prayer over and over and over again. If, I, if you were going to get a tattoo, I'd tell you get the tattoo of relationship <laughs> right now, okay? Not later, but right now, that's what I feel. Relationship, that's what prayer is about. Fellowship with God is to be our greatest joy. Does that strike you as odd? I'll be honest with you. There are times when prayer does not elicit joy in my heart, at least not, go, not having gone there yet, right? I'm like, uh, because it's work in some senses, right? But it's also that relationship. And the more I develop that relationship and grow that relationship, the more joy I will discover. See, when God is our greatest joy, then prayer becomes more of a loving relationship than a commercial transaction, Psalm 43, 4, the first part of that verse says this, Then I will come to the altar of God. And then he says this, To God, my greatest joy. You want to know where you are at with your relationship with God? How much do you enjoy him? Not just the word, not just preaching, not just those things, but how much do you enjoy being in the actual presence of God? We ought to find joy in that above all else. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, if God is not the supreme joy of our life, then our praying will become either routine or selfish. Everybody find that true? 
If God's not the thing that we go to, if he's not the reason we go to prayer in the first place, if it's not for the simple fact of fellowship and relationship with him and joy in him, the outcome is routine and it's selfish requests, and he says probably both. Our prayers will become routine because they lack heart, and they will lack heart because we have no passionate delight in the Lord as we pray. When praying is only a religious task, it becomes a mere duty we must complete each day so that we can fulfill our vows and quiet our consciences. This is the way religious legalists pray. They focus so much on following their routine, I would say rules. How many of you, okay, we got to pray before we eat? That is not a necessity. It is a privilege. And we get into a bad habit when we do it just out of routine. They focus so much on the following their routine and covering all their requests that they forget to worship, listen to this, to worship the Lord and express their love to the Father. Regardless of what burdens we carry or what problems we face, our first priority in prayer is to worship the Lord and rejoice in the privilege of communion with Him. In short, prayer isn't a religious routine of presenting endless requests as a sort of verbal prayer wheel. Prayer is primarily a joyful relationship between God's children and their blessed Heavenly Father, a relationship that deepens from day to day. If your prayer life, listen, are you listening to say amen? Let me step away so I get your attention. (laughs) Pastor trick. If your prayer life is not deeper than it was the day before, you're not growing. You're not growing in deepness with your relationship with your father. If it's the same thing every day and there's no heart and there's no feeling and there's no progress and there's no passion and there's no conversation and there's no relationship, listen, you are in a dangerous place. And we need to fight against that habit. Fight against the routine. You say, Dave, why are you preaching on this? Because we just got through a whole sermon series that Jesus says, pray like this. And he gives you a step-by-step outline. And it would be very easy to be like, okay, I did step one, I did step two, I did step three. I did, And you forget the relationship. And you forget why you go to God in the first place for the enjoyment of who God is. For God himself. We pray to deepen our relationship with God. We pray so that we will love God more deeply and let him love us and to accept his will and to be happy in his will. So here's the application. You got one long line in your notes. You ready for it? Say amen. Amen. This is going to sound really contradictory to everything I just said. Be daily disciplined in prayer. You see, any good relationship takes discipline. Amen? Amen. The strong marriage has disciplined participants. You do things even when you don't feel like doing them for your spouse. Amen? Amen? It's the same thing with prayer. If you want a vibrant, deep, passional relationship with your Heavenly Father in prayer, it takes, and I put this word in there specifically on purpose, daily Now, I don't want to get legalistic about this. You could easily turn this. You could turn anything into a legalistic uh, action, okay? But it's to be a daily discipline of prayer. Some of you say, I already have it. If you already have it, listen to me. You need to change it. Hmm. Change the time. Change the place. Change the way you do it. Change it. Change it up. It's like with a muscle. You work out the same muscle the same ways for years, and the muscle what? Grows accustomed to that. And it's no longer strained, so it's no longer growing And you need to change up your prayer habits from time to time. Warren Wearsby says this. He says, your daily meeting with the Lord is both the thermostat and the thermometer of your spiritual life. Isn't that a great quote? You can look at your prayer life right now and do a spiritual inventory. You can know where you're at. You can know where you're going to be. And you can test and see if you're in a good relationship with the Father. Now I'm going to give you a few practical things to do if you already do these things like I said change them up just in a minutia way first you must choose a time choose a time this time should be a time when you're at your best mentally and physically mine is when I come in in the mornings it's not always the same time but in my office I have a couch 
And I don't know, you'll notice in that couch there's an indentation in the middle of the cushions. It's not because I put my big butt there. (laughs) It's because I bow there as much as I can. This doesn't happen every day, but as much as I can, as often as I can, I, I try to routinely, that is the mark. When I walk through my office door, I try to make a beeline for that couch. And I start my mornings off at that time in prayer. You might need to get a very specific time, 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, whatever it is. Secondly, you must choose a place, preferably one where you're not interrupted or disturbed. You say, Dave, that's impossible. Well, pick the best place you can. Might be in your car before you go into work in the morning. Thirdly, you must bring your Bible and a notebook. You say, what does it have to do with prayer? This is how the Lord speaks to us. And I would suggest taking one book, just one book. Don't do this. Lord, what do you want to say to me today? How about this? Don't do that. Be systematic. Go through one book. Let the Lord speak to you through that book on a consistent basis over a prolonged period of time. Discipline in that book. And so you go to the Lord in prayer. You speak to him. You allow him to speak to you on a consistent basis through that book. And then you have a notebook. Why? Because when the Lord gives you a spiritual gem, you want to write it down. How many of you have been in prayer and the Lord speaks to you something so clear and you you thought, wow, that is awesome, and then you forgot it? Anybody? That happens to me all the time, right? You need to be writing it down, bring a notebook, bring a piece of paper, bring something so when you can sit and listen to the Lord, and there should be that time, listen to this, this is going to shock you, ready? There should be a time in your prayer time of just silence. Shutty the mouthy, and just listen for the Lord. Don't even, read, don't even read scripture. There's a time for that in your prayer life. But there should be just silence. Just, just absolute silence, waiting on the still, small voice of the Lord. Now, I'm not telling you that God's going to speak to you audibly. But he will speak to your spirit and to your heart. And normally what happens is you'll begin to see sin in your life. That's the first thing he goes for because he wants that intimate relationship and he wants to pull out that sin that's preventing that intimate relationship between the two of you. And so you sit still, even for start out with a few minutes, and you're going to get real uncomfortable, and that's a good place to be in your prayer life. But be ordered, be systematic, be meth- 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 methodological, <laughs> and choose one book. If you want to bring a list, Miss Linda has sacrificed her time to do a prayer list for this church and for this body. Bring that along with you. But listen, avoid reading through the list in prayer. Just blah, 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 blah. That's heartless. Just take the list with you. Maybe the Lord will say, you need to pray for so-and-so today. This hasn't been resolved. And God will highlight certain people and certain problems on that list. Lastly, you must bring a heart prepared to worship. You see, prayer is ultimately about worship. It's about relationship with God and worship. And a heart prepared to speak to him and to wait in silence before him. Now I want to remind you as we close. Luke chapter 11 verses 5 through 8. Anybody know what that's about? You're amazing if you get this. (laughs) Anybody remember? Let's look at it real quick actually. Luke chapter 11. How many of you have gone through a hard time in the last six months? Something difficult, a trial, something like that. Okay. How about the last year? Okay. Luke chapter 11, verse 5. Everybody there, say amen. Not everybody's there. Everybody there, say amen. amen. Luke chapter 11, verse number 5. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me, the door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give, any, give him anything, because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. You say, what is this about? This friend is going to his other friend at midnight because he's got guests, unexpected guests, and he needs food. It it was customary. It was rude to not have something prepared. And so he goes and he, 12 o'clock at night, they've been in bed for six hours. Oh, thank God he went away. (laughs) He comes back and he knocks again and he knocks again. Listen, the man in the house is not representative of God the Father. You know that, right? That's not God the Father. This is, this is an, an image of a person who is ungodly. Okay? It's the exact opposite of who God is. 
And so he's knocking and knocking and knocking. And the point is, is if persistence, 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 how much more so of a God who is willing to come and give automatically, right? But like the distraught neighbor in the parable, we don't need to pound on the Lord's door only in emergencies. This is what we do, right? God, a week goes by, a day goes by, a few weeks go by, our prayer lives lapse, and then something happens and we run into a financial crisis. Our marriage starts to get hurt. We're worried about what's going to happen next, right? But listen, if you will discipline yourself in prayer every day, set time, set place, set book, set Bible, set notebook, set time of listening, and just come to the Lord and say, Lord, it's our time. I don't even have to knock. Then when the trial comes, when the emergency comes, you got your time, you got your place, and you have already begun to understand and know the character of the guy inside the house. You know who he is. You don't have to, help, help. Lord, we've been talking for a long time. I know you have this in control. I know you. I know you're my father in heaven who loves me, and I'm not worried. So I'm coming to you asking for specific things, knowing you are in complete control. See, that's how our prayer life should build up our relationship with our God. Amen? I want to give you some book names to go along with those things. Because here's the thing, church. It has been on my heart, and I know other people's hearts in this church, to grow in prayer life. And, I, and, I, and, and here's the thing. I think the devil is doing this. I, I don't see it. I don't, I don't see the passion. I don't see, that doesn't mean it's not there. Okay, I'm just being transparent with you right now. I don't see the passion and the, the hunger. I don't see the thirst for God. I don't see, it, it's very disturbing as a pastor when someone asks, would someone like to pray and no hand goes up except for the same hands that always go up. That's discouraging and it's, it's, it's debilitating to a church. Because if this is who our God is, that should already be there. And what it is is an indication that we don't have that regular, hey God, I'm here again. Like he are, is our best friend and he's been there all the time and we have a daily conversation with him and it's like talking to our best friend and, and we can come to him and listen. And earlier we said in this, we said that God is our greatest joy. What does it say about us if we refuse and don't want to come to God? You say, well, I'm embarrassed about others. Listen, prayer is this <laughs> and it's on behalf of all of this. <laughs> so it's not just about you and him. It's about this whole pray like this, us, our, we. The plural pronouns. And it's a privilege to go before God. And so uh, I'm just being as transparent as I can. And listen, I know I'm not going to push you into a deeper prayer life. I want to lead you into a, a deeper prayer life. And I want you to see that and hear that and feel that and understand where this is coming from. I don't want to knock you over the head to pray more. That's never going to last. I just want you to be aware of what's going on and what we need in our church. Here's a few books. This one is Praying the Bible by Donald S. Whitney. This is more of an instructional type book, and it's very simple to read, very easy. I recommend it highly because it gives you some tools. It talks about praying the Psalms. If you don't know where to start in terms of praying the Bible, pray the Psalms. Here's another one. This is one of my favorites, The Valley of Vision. And um, this is a bit more intense. Uh, it's got a little bit more wordiness to it, but it's beautiful, and it's based on Scripture and the Puritan prayers and devotions of long ago, and it's just extremely impactful. I definitely recommend The Valley of Vision. There's also one that I don't have that I've heard good things about called New Morning Mercies by Paul David Tripp. Um, if you want to, you see, you see, in order to grow in any area, you got to up it, right? You can't do what you've always done. So you need to add something. You need to do something different. You need to have a new book. You need to get in a new prayer routine. You need to get in a new prayer space or something like that. And I encourage you to do that. So 